This is Think Tech Hawaii, Community Matters Here. Good afternoon. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Criminal justice reform is a big issue. Uh, today we're going to talk a bit about the paroling aspect of that. But in context, there's, it, it's one piece of a large entity, a large puzzle to some extent for a lot of people who don't fully understand everything that is related, all of the implications, the upsides, the downsides. Uh, included within all of that, we've got uh, sentencing and mandatory minimums and where that has come up in the past and potentially the future. Uh, that straight through to policing um, and how they go about doing that. We're not going to get into all those details on this particular episode. We're going to be focusing this show on paroling. And to help me have this conversation, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to welcome to the show Mr. Fred Hyun, the chair that is correct? correct? Chair of the Paroling Authority for the State of Hawaii. So thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. much. So, okay. Um, for starters, uh, what I like to do in my show is get a little introduction of the person I'm, I'm interviewing. So if you can give us a bit of your background, I've got your resume here, but a bit of your background of what you've done and what got you to this role that you're in. Uh, sure. That would be a great beginning. Well, I started actually with the YMCA system. Kalihi YMCA back in the 60s and dealing with housing kids and uh, children of, uh, how, how would you say, past inmates. And then after I completed my college education, I went into the Hawaii Air National Guard, came back from active duty and started with the Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility. So finding that my boss said, this is a dead end for you as a youth corrections officer. So he encouraged me to go back to school and get my master's, which I did in social work. And in 1975, I'm still with the youth correctional facilities, going to school and finally graduated. They gave me an opportunity to run the first halfway house for incarcerated juveniles. That was in 1975. So running that on a federal grant monies and state matching funds, we had that project going for five years until 1980. And then it was time to move on because we didn't have money to continue the halfway house. So then I started another federal project with the Intake Service Center, Oahu Intake Service Center, doing jail overcrowding. And we started with a pilot project with the Honolulu Police Department, uh, interviewing misdemeanors because there was a huge population that was just crowding the prisons or the jails. And then from there, uh, eventually became a permanent project, but we would interview inmate uh, arrestees, take them to district court, make all the necessary alerts for the sheriffs regarding mental health, suicide, violence, uh, drug uh, issues, and then would present bail recommendations to the presiding judge, arraignment judge. That stemmed off to a lot of other things such as uh, diversion, crisis management, and mental health issues, diverting them to the state hospital and the judges receiving all this information. And I did that for approximately 21 years. Wow. And then moved to the Big Island where I was the branch manager for Intake Services Center for the Third Circuit until my retirement in 2003, after which I was working with a, a call security as a corporate security type person uh, doing the administrative and compliance work. And after four years of that, I went to, I was pulled in by the Honolulu Liquor Commission on contract, and I worked for them for seven years until this position as chair of the Proling Authority came up. In between that stint, uh, in the early two, uh, 2001 in the, with the Lingal administration, I was called upon by Public Safety and Office of Youth Services to serve as a consultant because there was this big transition and um, uh, things going on at the Youth Correctional Facility. So I was working part-time as a special consultant there as well as working on the Big Island till I actually retired in 03. So it's been a long journey. and It I has. It's a lot of really good work. Uh, it, yeah. There's a lot of good positive work you've done in there mm -hmm. and I, I think not a lot of people understand the that that piece of it so mm -hmm. thank you for that window sure. of, of what you've done and um, 
so that that touches on one of the big topics mm -hmm. that goes that, that's really talked about on on all levels these mm -hmm. days, and certainly within Kalihi, which is O Triple C, and mm -hmm. uh, as as well as our you know, prisons and and juvenile facilities, mm -hmm. but but it's that overcrowding. Mm -hmm. It's what do we do and how do we do that. Mm -hmm. um, so th you've, you've worked on part of that in the past and how to help address that. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like we need you back again <laughs> doing that <laughs> uh, to a certain extent. But yeah. I, I know that you're involved in a number of areas in, yeah. in trying to help support that. So again, I, first of all, thank you mm -hmm. for all of the time and all of your service. Sure. Um, so now that you are in this role, and the, the, the chair of this authority. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about what the Proline Authority does mm -hmm. and, and what your direction is with it. Okay. I think before we go into that, make, we should understand the difference between a jail, which is pre-trial and short-term, okay. and a prison, which is more long-term. Yes. Okay. For five-year uh, type sentences and five... Hawaii has a indeterminate sentencing uh, requirements. So the courts have mandated sentences for those with a class C, five years, class B, 10 years, and a class A, 20 years. And then you have extended terms to life with possibility of parole. So when a person is arrested, they go through the court system, is convicted, and they are sentenced to prison. Now we're talking at least minimum of five years. Okay. All right. So once a person is sentenced, within six months, the parole board will set the minimum terms of incarceration before being eligible for parole. So there is a requirement which is determined by levels of punishment based on social history, criminal background, uh, their rel family relatives, ties in the state, and uh, uh, whole criteria that the board has to review in determining the levels of punishment as well as the seriousness of the offense. So the board will set the minimum within six months of being admitted and if it's three out of five or two out of five or five out of ten that is where the minimum comes in. A person is not automatically paroled once they have hit, hit their minimum but They'll, if they've complied with the treatment programs as prescribed by public safety, substance abuse, sex offender treatment, uh, cognitive things, and a lot of them are prescribed the general, uh, the GED or general equivalency diploma, will consider all of that towards their eligibility once they hit their minimum. So let's say a person comes in, has a minimum of two years, but has not completed all the RAD recommended programs, then we'll look at that and say, you know, you've had so many misconducts, you need to complete program. By law, we'll need to see them within 11 months. But, excuse me, 12 months, but we'll normally see them in 11 months. But if you're close to finishing your program, we can short set that and say, okay, you only need two months more to finish a program or four months more. We'll short set this and we'll see you in four months. You better have a good parole plan, which would mean place to live, employment, or readiness for work furlough. Okay. All right. Those are all very good questions and that mm -hmm. immediately, I, I, I want you to talk because I don't want to do most of the talking. Sure. Um, but I do have questions with sure. you. Um, so first of all, it, when people talk about, okay, they got off for good behavior, mm -hmm. this is what we're talking about. Okay. We're talking about they were they didn't have too many altercations while in, and they completed a program. Is that? It's more like programs. Programs. Because a person when they first come in, and let's say they've had a long-standing drug abuse problem, ICE is the biggest thing going right now. Mm -hmm. All right. So if they have not completed a certain level of program which was prescribed, and they needed additional type of if they're a sex offender, they need to complete sex offender uh, treatment, which would be a two-year program. Right? They need to complete these. Even if they're eligible for parole, they'll need to complete these before we will even consider release. 
as well as having a strong parole plan as residents or work furlough or anything else. Exactly. Now that was my next question. Mm -hmm. How do these inmates, and is that something that the parole office helps with, mm -hmm. how do these inmates create that plan? Okay, they work with the case managers in the facilities and everybody has, uh, the case managers ha are assigned to inmates and the inmates will have to work with classes or the instructors to get their credits. The case managers will do the assessment and uh, they'll show completion or not completion and we'll know and we have a pre-parole unit of parole officers who actually do the uh, they'll do their reports, pre-parole reports, to ascertain whether parole is recommended or not recommended based on completion of program or not, or placement or not. Okay. okay? So that includes um, helping them find a, a, a transition house? Yes. If they're able to get out, helping them mm -hmm. find a potential transition job? Sure. As well? Yes. Any other continuing education that comes on that? There could be. Some of them will go on to community college. But now the other thing is you'll find that a large majority or a large population have no work skills, have not held a job, need to be disciplined, work disciplined, educated in how to uh, just handle money. So that's why we normally recommend work furlough as a next step to transitioning out before parole. Okay. By going to work furlough, they'll be interacting with other inmates as well as staff they'll go through job seeking, job finding. Once they secure a job, then they can earn some money, regular wages. The minimum wage is I believe nine twenty five an hour now. Right now. Yeah. Right. So they'll earn minimum wage or more and we'll watch their adjustment while they're going through uh, their work. As well as eventually they'll go through say resocialization. If they have a family or people that they can go out to in the community. They may be placed on a four, six, eight, ten, twelve hour pass, all the way up to seventy two hours. So that helps with a transition back into the community, Which as is well important. as making yeah, because it's transit because yeah. you brought up all of the most important points there. Mm -hmm. It's transitioning back into the community, but also to be a positive producer within the community. Exactly, as well. correct. Yeah. So we have the case managers in the uh, furlough centers as well as with our project bridge at OCCC, they perform critical, uh, important tasks of assessing the inmate while they're going through that process, as well as our pre-parole people starting to pick up more of that and validating to help develop and confirm a viable parole plan. Okay. So all that needs to be brought in when we hold parole hearings. So after the minimums are set, they're eligible for parole and they complete programs and they go to, say in this case, work furlough. They'll go through this process of job seeking, holding a job and resocialization, then coming back with a strong parole plan as far as placement back in the community. Back in the community. Okay, wow. So there's a lot, there's a lot of work there, a exactly. lot of people supporting a lot of, so that's mm -hmm. okay, that's really good to understand. So mm -hmm. we're already at our break. Okay. Uh, so when we come back, we're going to talk uh, a bit about some of the success of that, sure. some of the challenges, and some of the goals going mm -hmm. forward. So thank you again for joining us, and thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, of Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna, and once again, welcome and I appreciate uh, my guest today, Mr. Fred Hyun, from uh, the chair of the Proling Authority here in the state of Hawaii. So see you in one minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Olelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search diveheart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life.
Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Mover, Shakers, and Reformers. Once again, I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Today we're talking about the Hawaii Paroling Authority and the role that they play within criminal justice and, and potential reforms in the future. So um, this conversation, once again, I will welcome to the show, welcome back, uh, Mr. Fred Hewn from uh, the uh, Paroling Authority. He is the chair of that authority. So once again, welcome, and thank you for the opportunity to help us learn yeah, what, what you do and what you've done. So mm -hmm. a lot of amazing work. So just as a summary, there's, it's a big picture. The paroling authority is is in charge of helping inmates transition back into the community to include a program, a plan, a set of plans that they need to accomplish in order to be able to get back into the community, have a placement back in the community, have a job, and have a, hopefully a productive path forward. And that's the goal to make it really succinct. Um, as you mentioned, off air, it's much more complicated than that. But um, so. My next question is, with all of that, what would you say, there, there are conversations about the you know, recidivism rate and um, a lot of other challenges. Uh, I, I don't want to go into um, too much at the moment with regards to the you know, number of people that we have in the jail versus mm -hmm. in the prison, and that's an important distinction mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but from what you have seen uh, through the paroling opportunity, through the paroling office, what is sort of the success rate that you see, or what is the recidivism rate, and what are some of the factors? Okay, well, if I can, if I may, if we can just step back a set, second, because I'd like to make a clarification that what happens in the prison and what happens with parole is a, basically a partnership okay. and a flow of, uh, of work in the process. So, you know, they both depend on each other. They have to work integrally with each other. Okay. So. As far as um, the parole board hearing cases, and again, there's the minimum sentencing, there is parole consideration, as well as parole violations, you know? Yes. So the board has to entertain all of these when the uh, hearings come up. And just as some numbers, we're dealing with over 4,000 in-person hearings a year. Okay. okay. When you add in the administrative hearings, such as reduction of minimums, interest, intrastate transfers, we're talking close to 6,000. That's a lot. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a big staff? We have four board members, okay. part-time, and one full-time, which is myself. We have a support staff of the secretary to the board. But we have, on each island, we, as well as Oahu, we have a total of approximately 53, 54 staff. Okay, wow. Parole officers and clerical, the administrator, branch, paroles and pardon administrator, the branch administrator, and uh, supervisors. So, okay. so that, know, that's, that's a lot. And then they have to coordinate with the, um, the jail and the prisons. Correct. And through all of the uh, social work aspects and all of the uh, programming in order to make sure that things are... Exactly. That's a big job. It's tremendous, and we have dedicated staff, and I really applaud, applaud the prison case managers for the work that they do as well. Absolutely. Because without a lot of their reports, it is very difficult for the parole board to do its job as yeah. well. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm... Um, um, I'm a licensed foster parent, and mm -hmm. so we have, it's nowhere close to the same, but I know that we work with uh, social workers and case workers with mm -hmm. regards to children, and mm -hmm. some of these children have parents mm -hmm. who are in and or in or out yeah. of prison uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and or jail, and uh, oftentimes we get a child because the parent or parents have gone to jail exactly. for a period sure. of time, mm -hmm. and then having to be there and sometimes having visits with them where we have to bring the children mm -hmm to OCCC, for example, mm -hmm. just so they can have some time through that transition period. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot to be dealt with mm -hmm. and a lot to be understood. And all of these people, and I want to echo that, all of these people who work doing this, they work very hard and they're very dedicated mm -hmm. and they are overworked, if you ask me. So you can very well understand the relationships that are involved. And, you know, we don't like to exclude anybody because everybody's integrally involved in a process. And you know, the judiciary as well, because we rely a lot on their reports and their pre-sentence investigations to help us with treatment planning, as well as setting other minimums, as well as finally granting parole. Right. Now, not all people are granted parole. It's not just 
Uh, everybody who does their time can go. There's a lot of uh, behavioral shaping involved because if an inmate is not ready, they can't go. Understand that the board's mission is to assess risk. The board's mission community is risk. community risk. Well, risk to the community and safety of the community. So if we have a dangerous person who is assessed as dangerous, as, has not completed programs, to us that's a risk. Right. You know, if they have a certain attitude, they're not showing remorse, these are things that we also take into consideration. But ultimately, it's to minimize any risk to the public before we're granting parole. And then we have supervision of various levels of inmates or parolees. You know, some need closer supervision than others. So we have a special services unit that monitors them very closely as well as those who are on, how would you say, uh, less restrictive supervision. So depending on their performance, depending on their behavior, depending on their record, do our POs make that, or parole officers make that assessment? And they're very good at what they do. And we do have a number of people violating, and we have to conduct revocation hearings, and sometimes we have to ultimately put them in custody. Now, when a bill, uh, a parole warrant is issued, it's a no bail. So they can't just post bail like in pretrial and get out. They are there until we hold a revocation uh, parole violation hearing, and there's a good chance they may be revoked to the max or their sentence because we can't hold them beyond. And we may come back within six months or it could be longer. So the parole board has to make that type of decision based on their not complying with the terms and conditions of parole. So when they get out, it's not like they got a free ticket out. Right, exactly. Now, mm -hmm. with that, though, if they, if they don't go through, if they don't receive a paroling or an early paroling mm -hmm. uh, under any of the conditions mm -hmm. or any of the uh, um, possibles mm -hmm. uh, there, and they have served their full term, mm -hmm. they're, they're then released. They're released. Are you involved at that part, at that point, as far as their transition, or is that an entirely different entity that helps with that transition, or are they literally just, here's the door, go? Basically, it's here that here's the door, you're done. But you know, if I may plug, there are some organizations such as Bud Bowles with United Self Help, mm -hmm. who does pick up some of the max out types who have mental health issues, and he'll escort them and try and uh, help them with a, some spending money and accommodations temporarily. But as a whole, they're out. Yeah. We have referred some like uh, on the neighbor islands, to some other housing, but they have to show homelessness first before that program can pick them right, up. Right, right. But basically they're on their own once they max and out. And it seems to me if you've been in jail for however long and you just are let out, you're homeless. It just <laughs> immediately, unless I guess if you go back they're to family whatever family you have. friends or whatever, so, yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, all right. We have a few minutes left. Um, what I would like to, somewhat transition to is as far as any potential reforms I know there's a reform there's a, um, a criminal justice task mm -hmm. force uh, as, uh, that I've been lucky enough to be able to attend some of the mm -hmm. meetings for um, as far as thinking for the future and as far as what sort of your future guidance is of what mm -hmm. you're trying to accomplish within that what are some of the challenges and what uh, what are you looking for as far as accomplishments as far as your department is concerned? Mm -hmm. Well, for the board, we want good, accurate information to make good, uh, to make good decisions regarding parole. You know, we're stuck with the problem of drugs. Yeah. And unfortunately, you have to expect addicts to probably relapse time and time and again to finally they get it. But housing is critical towards parole. Uh, and rehabilitation. Without housing, we have no place to put these individuals back into the community. So that's a big issue. Follow-up treatment, substance abuse, drop-in centers, you know, if we had more like that here and on the neighbor islands, some of these lost 
past parole, maxed out types would at least have some place to go. Okay, so extended some extended services mm -hmm. through parole and beyond parole. Yes. Uh, so that they're not falling off, because that, that's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Even within the foster care mm -hmm. system, what we worry about is whether they emancipate themselves mm -hmm. or whether they age out, they're just going to fall off a cliff. Mm -hmm. Where do they go? And how do we help them still? So I, that, that's sort of what you're saying yeah. is, is a sort of continuation because of services. Those things will bring back the offender yeah. to reoffend the recidivism rate. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, and a lot of them are, re, are repeaters. They've been in prison two, three times already. Yeah. Um, two things that usually help reduce the recidivism, re, recidivism is education and age. Because they get to a certain point where that criminal life is just too much yeah. and they can't, they realize they can't be going to prison. But we can't wait for everybody to get educated and age out, right? Right, right. So, but what about that as a, as a service? You mentioned they go through, uh, some of them are required to get a GED, some of them perhaps mm -hmm. already have it, some of them perhaps finished high school and mm -hmm. wh whatever it is, but whatever those. Um, what about bringing a different level of education in? What about like a vocational training or a mm -hmm. trade, getting them involved more in a trade mm -hmm. so that their path forward mm -hmm. has a positive ring at the end that they mm -hmm. can see, that they can reach for as opposed mm -hmm. to, okay, you've got your GED, good luck, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Is that sort of a, along the lines of some of the, some of the continued services that you'd be well, thinking about? You know, since I came back out of retirement <laughs> and what I've seen with public safety, uh, the amount of programs available to inmates is a hundredfold compared to when I used to be in the system. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, inmates from the mainland as well as over here who have taken additional courses like parenting, father, uh, being a father, um, these type of things of, which help them on the outside. And they're taking it on their own. These things were never offered before. But what's also important is the cultural programs, especially for Native Hawaiian. Yes. You know, and we've I have seen and the board has seen those inmates who have taken the cultural programs, who have a stronger sense of confidence, self-esteem. They feel there's more of a calmness because they know who they are. And you know we'd like to see more of these programs. I, I think that is excellent. I, um, yeah. I one of my friends uh, is Kuhina. I know that she has come and she's been involved mm -hmm. in some of that. Um, one of my other friends is uh, Kai Markel. Mm -hmm. I know that he's been involved. He does well in the photo of some of the things that. It, so hearing some of their stories as mm -hmm. well uh, connects with what you're saying. So and yeah. we just saw I just saw Hina and uh, we we're in the task force a little while ago, mm -hmm. and we recognize Hina's work because. It shows in the inmates and how they come before the parole board. It's such an important piece. Oh, so such much. Such an important piece. So. so much. We are unfortunately at the end of our show. Uh, so thank you so much. I would love to have you come back again uh, to dig deeper into. We can find sure. a, a particular part of it uh, that we can dig into. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate learning mm -hmm. about what you're doing and what you've done in your career. And thank you for all oh, of your service. Thank you. I really appreciate so. it. All right, so thank you again, and thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Uh, next week is Labor Day. We are going to have a Labor Day special, so please join us then when we are going to hear about labor in Hawaii. See you then.